Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Hilde Wallem Nilsen, and I wish you welcome to this uh, open seminar on photographic colonial legacies and indigenous decolonial activism. A particularly warm welcome to uh, our invited speakers from Finland, SAPME, and Denmark, and to all of you who follow us online. This event marks the recent publication of the edited volume Adjusting the Lens. While uh, Sigrid Lien and I have uh, edited the volume, uh, we have received contributions from a number of distinguished scholars, friends and colleagues from SAPME, Norway, Finland, Denmark, UK, Canada and Australia. Some of them are in Bergen today, others hopefully follow us online. There will be four presentations today, uh, respectively by Veli Pekka Lehtola, Laura Junka Aikiu, Mette Sandby and the editors. But first we would like to shortly introduce the volume. In September 2019, the Sami art activist group Sopan Terror published a statement in the form of a poster on the Facebook page. The poster fe features a bleeding, bodiless hand placed on the pages of an open book, drawn with broad black contour lines. The graphic bears a strong likeness to Facebook's own like icon. But the hand Hand's tight fist alludes to protest as if it's hitting the table, cuffed by a part of the Sami flag. The hand rests in a pool of blood. Moreover, it seems to be in the process of disintegrating or melting against the backdrop of a washed out photograph of a snowy landscape with a bridge looming in the foreground. It's not easy to de decipher this complex visual constellation but the poster's textual framing, a quote in both Sami and Norwegian, helps. When hunger strikes, arguments or demonstrations fail, there is, there is only one language the authorities understand. It's their own language. As the poster states, these words were uttered in 1892 by the Sami activist Nilla Sombi in Alta, northern Norway. Events in Alta in 1982, have a particular significance for the Sami, the indigenous peoples of Norway, Sweden and Finland and Northwest Russia. The historical context is as follows. Due to the re requirements of reconstruction after the Second World War, the Norwegian state started to build large dams in Sami areas. The campaign against dam construction started in the 1960s and the largest and most well-known was the 10-year conflict to, pro uh, to protect the Alta Guaidogeno river system, which raged from 1968 to 1982. The threat of environmental de destruction was, of course, a motivator, but for the Sami, the immediate concern having a right to say how their own areas were used. The Supreme Court's final decision in 1982 established the legality of the project and the protests took a dramatic turn. Sami activists attempted to blow up a bridge leading to the construction area. The sabotage failed and one of the activists, Nilas Sombi, lost an eye and a hand. These events were the political backdrop to Swapan Taro's poster. They also led to the creation of another visual reference, a black and white photograph by the Sami artist Harry Johansson. This image, produced in 1982, shortly after the sabotage attempts, depicts a frozen hand lying on a voluminous copy of the Norwegian Code of Law. The hand and book were photographed against a stark black background, which add a sense of monumentality to the scene. The hand represented is Sombi's own, the one he lost in the blast. Johansen, who is Sombi's cousin, tells the story behind the image. In August 1982, Nila Sombi is home in Serma. He has kept his torn off arm. It lies in the freezer, wrapped in a black plastic bag, 
and we get the idea of photographing it the way it is. The arm looks like a plastic arm, and I do not get any feeling of it once having been a real arm. A black carpet is stretched across the kitchen table. We find a volume of the Norwegian Code of Law using a desk lamp <coughs> as lightning and take the picture. What happens after with the arm is unknown to me, but the image is there as evidence of a sacrifice. The effect is that of a sacrificial mo monument with the hand of death clinging to a tombstone-like law book. Sopantaro's poster, in contrast, paying homage to both past and contemporary uh, activism, presents a hand that has risen to new life, still bleeding. The red blood has even made its mark on or contaminated the pages of the book. The scene no longer has the air of a grave memorial, but born out of a time of disillusionment and defeat, featuring fresh blood, a raised thumb, and the support of the Sami flag, the hand has a new vitality. Monsieur uh, appropriation of it, our examples of how photography is being used in indigenous cultural and political activism in many places around the world. Although Sue Pontero, in this case, made use of a late 20th century photograph produced by a fellow Sami artist, the group also, like many indigenous artists and activists around the world, incorporate colonial images in its visual activism. Photographs are used to point to various forms for, of injustice and abuse by majority societies and to give voice to struggles for indigenous rights, for example, in relation to natural resources and land. Moreover, photographs are used to advocate uh, spa for space for indigenous cultural heritage, identity and language and in calls for rec recognition, sovereignty, integrity and self-determination. Adjusting the lens um, explores the role of um, 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 uh, indigenous photography in the past and present through a series of case studies. It brings to light and discusses colonial uh, photographs in multiple and dispersed archives, museums, and institutions in relation to their context, uh, distribution, circulation, and uses through time and space. <coughs> Thus, it also explores how this photographic legacy <coughs> is being handled and used in new ways in contemporary society as exemplified by Sue Panteros and Harry Johansson's work. Today, there is a growing academic, political, and economic interest in geographical areas inhabited by indigenous peoples, not least in the Arctic, where Sue Pantero and Harry Johansson live and work. Much of the interest in these marginal topographies is connected to climate change, natural resources, and tourism, but it also reflects a renewed awareness of the people who live in, in them. The significant role of photography, both in historical processes involving indigenous peoples and contemporary practices of negotiating the past, is now an emergent field of research. Adjusting the lens uh, is a study of the intersection of photography and indigeneity in uh, a transnational and comparative perspective. The pertinence of such an approach is uh, underlined by how indigenous people today increasingly associate with, with each other on a global basis. Yet, while many of the contributions uh, to the field so far has, have centered on First Nation peoples uh, in the Americas, Australia, and non-Western societies, this volume aims to broaden the field by including indigenous peoples of Northern Europe. The contributors to this volume re recognize that colonialism is still an ongoing process within the settler societies in question. Ignorance and repression, 
not only apply to the past, but also to the contemporary situation, which is still colored by persistent colonial relations and structures that are not universally recognized. Building on the last few decades of photography studies, we recognize and trace how photography has been integral to the maintenance of colonial power. First, post-colonial and decolonial criticism uh, from all around the globe has challenged the dominant aesthetic photo focus on works by canonized European and American photographers and in an incessant di discussions about the, uh, around the specific specificities of, on, of the photographic medium itself. The field has now expanded to include other histories, topographies, images and actors. Second, we pay co closer attention to the power dynamics of photography, particularly in the colonial context. And third and finally, in recognition of photography's intimate connection to the colonialism's culture, our work explores not only the production context, but also how images are embedded in larger visual economies, used and circulated. By building on and expanding these three trends, adjusting the lens points toward a fourth and emerging current within photography studies, reflections on photography and decoloniality. So that ends the introduction, and it is now my honor to uh, introduce the first speaker, Beli Pekaletula, who is a professor of Sami culture in Gallagher's Institute at the University of Olo in Finland. He is a North Sami, um, and his research uh, focuses on the history of Sami and Lapland, uh, modern Sami art, and the development of Sami representations. Um, uh, in English, he has written about 30 scientific articles. He has published the Sami people trans traditions in uh, transition from 2004 mm -hmm. and surviving the up upheaval of the Arctic war in, from 2019. So the floor is yours, Veli Pekka. Thank you. Uh, wait a minute. I, I will show only that uh, the cover. The cover? Uh, the cover of the book. There is my. I just noticed that there is my grandfather. Oh. Uh, second uh, from left. And well. this uh, this photo was taken uh, during the the so-called German War when the Sami were evacuated from uh, in Finland. They were evacuated uh, from Sami to to the middle of the Finland. Finland, and that's why he's not using. Sami costume because uh, they had to, uh, they had only two hours to leave, and uh, they could only take what uh, what was able, what they were able to carry. So that was the situation. Okay. All right. This uh, this article, in, my article in the book, is uh, based on my uh, experiences, uh, uh, maybe during twenty or thirty years, from repatriating uh, photographs to Sami community. In uh, uh, there have been, I I, I have been uh, participated uh, to projects. Uh, with the Sami Museum Sita in Inari, my home uh, village. Uh, and then I, I have been also editing quite uh, a lot of books that uh, where, where we have... Uh, um, it has been also repatriation of, uh, of photographs because uh, we, we have wanted to, uh, to uh, return them to the Sami and uh, we have only uh, uh, used photographs where we know each of them who are in the photographs so, so that they wouldn't be nameless. 
lapse or nameless Sami, but, uh, but uh, everyone would have uh, names and uh, stories. And our work was not uh, very theoretical at the beginning, at, at least. Uh, but uh, it was more practical one that we knew that uh, in the southern archives there are <coughs> myriads of uh, photographs uh, about Sami. Uh, and we wanted uh, to, to return them, them uh, to the museum. And nowadays uh, uh, Sami Museum Sita in Inari is the, uh, maybe the center uh, archive also for the uh, photographs uh, concerning the Sami people. But uh, later, after reading Sigrid's and, uh, and uh, Hilde's uh, article, I understand, I understand that the same similar uh, processes were going on globally, <laughs> that uh, Blackfoot in Indians uh, uh, among Australi uh, aboriginals in Australia, in Norway, uh, other Sami people were doing the same, and, uh, and uh, uh, the same ideas were seen uh, in, in different, different uh, uh, parts of the, of the world. Well, let's uh, begin with the uh, with a photograph uh, that is not in my article, but uh, it's interesting about uh, uh, Sami Museum Sita. And uh, this is usual that uh, there is a picture and then there is a text saying that linguist Erki Itkonen in his fieldwork in Lemmejoki in uh, 1933 with a lab guide. There, so that researcher is mentioned by name Sometimes even his equipment is mentioned by name, but the, uh, the lab guide, who, who must be quite important for, for him, uh, was not mentioned. But uh, it was the habit uh, of that time. And uh, when the Sami will start looking for, for the context is for this uh, photograph, he he finds out that guide is another Erkki, Johan Erkki Jompanen, and uh, who is uh, this, this guy? He's, uh, he became one of the most remarkable Sami politicians in Finland after the Second World War. Uh, he was a strong man in, in the Inari Municipality Council, in reindeer herding administration, and uh, later in the, uh, in the Sami parliament starting in 1972. And he was also a founder of uh, Sami, first Sami Museum in, in Finland in 1963. And you can see here uh, as a military man in the wartime and then, uh, then opening the, the Sami conference in Inari. So uh, when turned out to the Sami perspective, you, we could make the same sentence Johan Erkki Jompanen from Lemmejoki with a fin. <laughs> or maybe, well, well, let it be with a Finnish researcher. <laughs> or, or maybe it would be proper to say that Erkki Jompanen with a researcher, uh, Erkki Itkonen. Well, this is the, the way that uh, we pointed wanted to turn this uh, perspective and uh, uh, this ethnological photo material, you can also treat it uh, uh, in another way that uh, uh, Sigrid can mention uh, ex examples where the Sami, <coughs> where the Sami have uh, uh, considered this, uh, this uh, photo uh, old photo material as a, a totally colonialistic institution, that uh, we don't use it, we don't uh, want to deal with it. But uh, we were seeing them as um, uh, about the perspective of multiple stories, multiple histories, that there is not only one history in the photographs, the, the colonial history, but uh, there are also uh, multiple other histories, uh, and from that point, uh, this is valuable material when 
trying to return the voices of ancestors and and uh, experiences, uh, lived environments, and the senses of places. And uh, as you see, the, when changing the perspective, also the content, the content changes. That, for instance, here, this picture that you could say that uh, there are laps from Utsjoki, but when you contextualize this uh, photograph, is the, uh, it is the county council of Utsjoki municipality which was uh, totally Sami. They were all Sami members in in 1920s. So, so it's quite interesting, also compared to Norway and, and Sweden, where, where uh, the Sami uh, membership in this kind of uh, local administration was restricted, but uh, in Finland it was not. <coughs> well, when interpreted uh, uh, through the lenses of these uh, objects uh, themselves, the, these uh, photographs uh, tell, tell multiple visualized stories about our histories, as I called it, uh, the recent past of so, uh, small communities. And uh, as with uh, Erkki Jomppanen, uh, it brings uh, out uh, also uh, an, uh, other stories about ethnopolitical actors, modern, uh, modern institutes, uh, and uh, Sami, uh, the Sami as modern citizens. So, so it is, uh, 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 I, I would say that our histories, this, uh, this concept of our histories normalizes the, the representations of uh, Sami history, which uh, we often depict as, uh, as uh, kind of uh, epic field of, uh, of uh, colonial forces uh, oppressing the Sam, uh, helpless Sami. But uh, in this, uh, our histories, we see the Sami as uh, subjects of their history, and, uh, and we see that uh, they cope anyway in, in the uh, everyday life. And, uh, when we were making interviews about uh, or these uh, collective uh, uh, meetings uh, about this, uh, these photographs, uh, we noticed that uh, we could uh, speak about them, uh, that uh, they would uh, not mention, for instance, the, the uh, Finnish society at all, that it was all happening in our in our uh, 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 environment. Well, about the, uh, the uh, photographs, uh, there, uh, there, ha there are lots and lots of them, and uh, until 60s or 70s, photographs uh, of the Sami were taken mainly by outsiders. Uh, and they were depicting something that was dif different from us, and uh, it can be analyzed in these uh, these pic uh, pictures. And, and uh, this uh, this was connected to the scientific and public interest on Sami culture. Uh, there were Sami photographs also uh, in Sweden already in 19 and, and 10. And then, then in Finland in 1920s, already some Arnar Inaris uh, Sami were taking photographs. And it is quite interesting to see those photos, but uh, that's not, uh, that's not, uh, uh, I will not speak more about that. But uh, how, do, how can you use them? They, they have been used quite a lot as, uh, uh, as uh, for instance, in textbooks, uh, in postcards, and so on. But nowadays, uh, they can be seen uh, through visual anthropology, uh, as, uh, as said that uh, they, they, are, they can be seen as reflections of our gaze to the other, uh, as, a, as a way of looking at something culturally different and, and or as uh, Elizabeth Edwards says, 
visual mapping of uh, colonial experience. Or another way is to use them as uh, an in inspiration for artistic work. For instance, here Maria Helander, a Sami photographer uh, in 1990s, made these kind of uh, uh, these uh, works about about <laughs> his own grandfather and also my grand uh, uh, forefather uh, Katja Nilla, and uh, she was. Uh, depicting something, uh, making a bridge between Sami ancestors and us, and uh, the old heritage uh, and uh, modern times. And you can see that, uh, that uh, how, how it can be inspiration for artistic work. And then uh, this was the, the way that uh, we were do, uh, doing uh, as a source for our histories. And, and when returned and repatriated to the local level, uh, to those people whose ancestors uh, they concern, the uh, mm, photographs uh, which were without names in archives and uh, many times even uh, without contents, uh, they start telling uh, totally different stories that uh, they were uh, uh, originally telling, and uh, they are not just some laps anymore, but uh, but uh, life stories of uh, personalities and and communities, and and here we are constructing with a common ide identity. So, uh, uh, Finnish historian Jorma Kalella has said that uh, many small communities tell their own histories, which can strongly differ from established or official historical de de uh, descriptions or scientific representations of the past. <coughs> and uh, as I said, uh, in our meetings, uh, our histories could be uh, discussed uh, maybe without referring to dominant soci societies at all. And uh, uh, they can be uh, told without the frame, frames of colonialism. So these are kind of uh, double exposures uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, they can reveal uh, intra-ethnic uh, 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 or they are, they are many times revealing uh, these intra-ethnic intra uh, um, uh, contradictions uh, we could say that uh, distinctive features between between the Sami and the and the majority, but uh, uh, now in our work the focus was in intra-ethnic relations between us in local communities. Uh, so it was emphasizing more the connecting things than than the distinctive uh, features. Well, you know, I, I'm sure you know in Norway this, uh, this is an iconic photograph, uh, colonial photograph about the Sami classroom in Karasjok. And uh, the boy is reading uh, uh, about reading in Norwegian here. And uh, you maybe have also seen a documentary uh, short uh, documentary film uh, from the same situation, and, and a girl is writing the word "moor" to the to the uh, clock board, and uh, it is a uh, it is a uh, interesting symbol or clear symbol of colonialism because uh, in their time it was uh, taken the photograph was taken to to. Uh, uh, embraced uh, the uh, success of uh, Norwegianization, but nowadays we see it as a as a uh, as a uh, symbol of colonialism. How how the Sami were were made to uh, change their cultural habits, but uh, if uh, I, and I am sure in Norwegian side uh, it has been analyzed. Uh, but uh, I don't know more about that. But I would uh, 
suspect that uh, when, uh, when seen from intra-ethnic level, the, uh, the people would be interested who the people are, what are their stories, what did they do later, and not so much that uh, about that Norwegian teacher and uh, that there was this colonialistic uh, education system uh, going on. And in this, uh, our histories, we are not telling about the Sami as victims of modernization, for example, but uh, our stories uh, in the everyday level without no wonder, for instance, for technical innovations. Here you can see happy uh, postman Hannu Mattus speeding with uh, an outboard uh, motor. And uh, you can be sure that uh, he could also fix that motor very well. And uh, already in 1920s, using the boat motors and fixing them became a, a tradition uh, among the Sami. And uh, for instance, uh, adopting uh, later another innovation, uh, the snow, snowmobile, did not mean a radical change to the traditional knowledge of the Sami, that uh, it was traditional knowledge of the Sami already that time. And from 60s and 70s and, and uh, even nowadays, you have many uh, uh, a collection of stories about the Sami, how they can manage with, uh, with this uh, motorcycle uh, and uh, if, if, if it breaks down. Well, Philippe de Loria, uh, a Dakota historian, has said in, a, in a, this, is a, this book, uh, Indians in Unexpected Places, is a, a Bible of mine. So he says there that uh, already in early history, some Indian people or North American people have leaped uh, quickly into modernity not because they adopted political or legal tools for, from whites, or not because uh, of acculturation or assimilation or colonization, but because of their own will, because they, they wanted to do so. And uh, they were engaging the same forces of modernization that were making non-Indians to re-evaluate uh, their own expectation of themselves and their society. But while no, uh, non-Indians are, are uh, in a way allowed <coughs> to re-evaluate their, their uh, society and, uh, and themselves, the, usually the Sami are, are not that they, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, expected to, to live a so-called traditional life. Uh, and that's why there are a lot of stories that, that uh, have uh, not been uh, told until nowadays uh, as uh, something natural for the, for the Sami people. Uh, that if you think uh, Sami in un unexpected places, they can be uh, uh, in, in uh, Norse polar expedition in, in Greenland or moving uh, uh, from Finnmark uh, to Alaska to teach Inuits to herd reindeer or in lap caravans uh, to, touring in Europe uh, uh, introducing Sami culture in the, of course, in the framework of popular, popularized uh, ethnography, but uh, Anyway, and uh, an unexpected costumes that uh, uh, it, it's uh, very typical for old photographs that uh, the Sami have all, uh, always have to be in their Sami costumes, that uh, they are rarely uh, photographed uh, uh, in, in other costumes, that these kind of pictures are from the family albums of the Sami themselves. For instance, it was taken in Watsa in the, in the photographic uh, studio by himself, and uh, it has been in the family, 
family album and the outsiders wouldn't be very interested in, in the, these kind of uh, photographs that uh, they always there are always these expectations and unexpected places and costumes for instance this Inarisami family uh, in the in the uh, moving uh, photo studio in Inari in 1920s and their costumes are also this kind of uh, that uh, would not interest uh, outsiders very much. This is also from from the home album. Well, that was my my issue today. Well, thank you so much, Willy Pekka. Uh, I think we have time for some questions, if there are any. Mette? I would have, like to ask that, um, I mean, you have been following this field for 30 years or something as we start, or you were introduced by, by Sigrid. So how, uh, I mean, recently, how do you think the interest from others outside the Sami culture has, has been, I mean, it's a huge question, but I was just curious to see, hear your reflections on how this field has changed. Uh, because, for instance, I was thinking comparing to like Greenland that I'm going to talk about, a lot has happened the last maybe 10 years. And of course, something comes from inside that people are much more you know, uh, aware of strengthening their culture and uh, becoming independent, etc. But there has been a renewed interest from outside, even maybe too much that is kind of in fashion to be interested in something related to the Arctic or to Greenland or maybe to Sami culture. I was thinking of, for instance, the huge presentation of uh, Sami art uh, at the last Documenta. And so I was just th thinking, what are, do you have some reflections on that? Is this something that people are suddenly, you know, ah, attacking? We want to be know about Sami culture. And, and is it a good thing or is it sometimes times maybe too much? Do you see what I mean? Uh, yes, I see. It's a uh, quite large. Yeah, it is. I large guess. I mean question. Well, well, yes. Uh, there is a lot of interest, and uh, there is uh, many processes going on right now about the uh, ethical guidelines for for how to how to uh, uh, use Sami uh, uh, the material concerning the Sami in in tourist uh, touristic business uh, in research in in uh, how to depict uh, sami so and uh, in also in film in this industry so it uh, it uh, describes that uh, that there are these uh, first uh, firstly the sami are quite many speaking that uh, they are tired to be studied and photographed uh, and so on and it has been shown in in many ways but on the other hand uh, it's uh, uh, I'm thinking something positive here positive <laughs> here that uh, it's uh, also that the Sami uh, for instance the social media has been very very useful for the Sami just uh, in this issue, for instance, uh, because uh, they are now doing the same that we were doing before the social media, that uh, they, they are changing the, the information and so on. But there is also one question that is interesting, that uh, how the uh, different uh, uh, Different uh, mm, <coughs> uh, different uh, conceptions collide. That, uh, for instance, uh, we have, uh, or in in this institution, in in the in the majority institution, is this uh, ideal of uh, open access idea, and uh, and uh, in, among the Sami and uh, indigenous peoples, this is also. Uh, they are concerned about that, 
and uh, in Finland, for instance, I, I am sure also in Norway, there are examples about uh, when you put open access uh, photographs to open access, then they be, will also be misused. That, for instance, there, there was uh, in Finland uh, just uh, uh, last uh, autumn, there was a case that uh, uh, m was it the National uh, Museum? Well, I don't remember, <coughs> but they opened uh, thousands of, uh, of photographs, including Sami photographs. And, and I think they were happy themselves that uh, also the Sami are very, very satisfied that uh, there will be. And uh, suddenly the sc some scold Sami saw that they, uh, their grandmother, uh, already deceased grandmother, was uh, decorating uh, an uh, art artworks in or, or this kind of uh, 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 industrial artwork in in the, in the America, and they were even that uh, their grand uh, grandmother was sat on uh, because it was uh, something to do with the bottom, if you remember. But, uh, but uh, it was uh, quite a scandalous case, but it was uh, the collision of this, mm. these uh, conceptions yeah. and values. Yeah. One more question, though. Will you add one? Yes. You have the, um, I was just wondering, you have been talking about how you read these other stories into the colonial photographs. But I, I wonder, is it sometimes difficult or Im even impossible to do that? Uh, what? To, 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 to read your stories into the colonial photographs. Uh, yes, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, impossible as such. But, uh, but uh, if you think that uh, what kind of... what. Uh, uh, what kind of discussions do they produce? Then, then you get uh, to the to the our histories. That, uh, of course, it's not not mechanical. That uh, what what you get from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Well, then it's a great pleasure for me to. Um, to uh, introduce uh, Laura Juncker Aikiu. Uh, Laura, she is a research fellow at the Arctic University of Norway's University Museum in Tromsø. She has a very interdisciplinary background in the arts and photography, international politics, as well as cultural studies. She has published widely on issues such as indigenous politics, identity, right, uh, rights, and arts. So. The floor is yours. Okay, so I really want to thank uh, Hilda and Sigrid for inviting uh, me to talk here. And I have to say that I felt so happy when I got this book in my hand because uh, I think that uh, you have done really good work of bringing together really interesting uh, chapters uh, which actually communicate with each other. So I also felt that my own work actually gets an um, extra layer of meaning in this context. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, <clears throat> so my... Uh, okay, and I see that there's a spelling mistake to start with, but uh, <laughs> never mind. So, uh, okay, so my own contribution to this book actually deals with Suopantero, which is obviously the same artist group that uh, Sigrid and Hilda started their presentation with. And uh, so the title of the chapter is Indigenous Culture Jamming, Suopantero and the Art of Articulating a Sami Political Community. And uh, this chapter um, <coughs> examines uh, the work of uh, Suopantero, which uh, emerged uh, around early 2010s. Uh, it's uh, not 
doesn't uh, define itself as a Sami in Finland, it's a pan-Sami group in a sense, but very much of the work is really rooted in issues uh, that are taking place in Finland. <clears throat> and uh, it's, a, it's a group which um, uh, started by, uh, like, if I describe in my own words, uh, when I first met Suopantero's work, I was actually just uh, using Facebook and suddenly Lots of friends start circulating these images, but nobody really knows who made them, what, where did they come from. And it was such a nice, uh, interesting and exciting thing to actually start seeing these images. Uh, and I think much of the charm related to the fact that we didn't really know where they came from. So very much uh, anonymity, anonymity was very much central uh, to Suopantero's work. And basically uh, the work uh, was this kind of uh, tradition of poster art. So basically uh, they work uh, with these posters, but which are online posters. So they have been disseminated mainly through Facebook, especially in these early times. And these posters are uh, a kind of uh, textbook examples of culture jamming or of artivism or of, um, there's many ways, uh, names for describing this kind of art in which uh, you take uh, well-known images or adverts or uh, other um, uh, images from popular culture and uh, convert them, appropriate them for new ends uh, by making some changes. And of course, in the age of digital media, this has become uh, also very easy in new ways. So basically, uh, Suopantero's work is, is very much about taking, using kind of global image archives and giving them a Sami twist, giving them new meaning, using them in ways that appropriate these images for the ends of, uh, of those Sami who are doing this. And so in my chapter, I conceptualize this as indigenous culture jamming, uh, because also I think what is very important is that the, in the kind of uh, literature and theorization of cultural jamming, uh, um, it's kind of originated as a um, uh, critique of consumer culture and of the kind of uh, uh, presence of uh, advertisement all over us. So basically in the context of indigenous culture jamming, the critique extends very much that of consumer culture. It encompasses all kinds of things that the indigenous people are dealing with, including extractivism, uh, political uh, lack of uh, political uh, sovereignty, etc. So, uh, okay, so Suopantero's work became actually quite popular in quite a short time because it was so new, it was so refreshed. And so it has been uh, very much um, interpreted in uh, different interviews and uh, analysis as an uh, example of a uh, Sami kind of visual decolonization or decolonization work, which it of, of course it is. And uh, basically uh, the idea or the, the way it's uh, most easily read is that these images are decolonizing rev um, older representations of the Sami, which often presented Sami as, as passive, as, as lacking agency, etc. And so much of these uh, images are kind of uh, giving the Sami hyper agency. So there's also a little bit militaristic images, or as you can see, for example, this one. Uh, this is certainly not the passive Sami woman that is depicted. And uh, um, so, so these images definitely are deconstructing and decolonizing earlier images and replacing them new, with new different imaginaries. But, uh, but what we are, or what I was kind of interested in, in Suopantera's work when I started to write about is that uh, I think in this analysis, uh, the kind of local level, which I consider uh, most important is of the missing. So basically these images, they work, like you can see them as decolonizing without any knowledge of the Sami as such. They work on that level. Then you can understand these images uh, within the national context as commenting or Nordic context as commenting on certain uh, uh, more locally specific issues. But then there's also a local level, and that's the level that I want to talk about here, uh, on which uh, the meanings of these images can actually be quite different, or there's kind of added layers of meaning that you don't necessarily, or which you will be unable to read unless you have the necessary knowledge. 
And I argue that this level is actually maybe the most important aspect of the decolonial work that is going on in Suopantero's work. Uh, and obviously this doesn't negate the other levels of meaning, so all the levels of meaning can exist in the same images. And so what I argue is that these uh, actually, they do not just deconstruct images, uh, or representation of the Sami, but actually uh, contribute to uh, building uh, or constructing Sami political communities online. And uh, the case through which I uh, make this argument uh, in, uh, in the chapter uh, goes back to kind of uh, events or discussions that were very intensive in 2013. So uh, basically, um, <clears throat> uh, in Finland, one of the issues that has been very, very uh, central for Sami politics uh, for the past decades is uh, a kind of a growing um, struggle or um, argument about uh, Sami parliament's electoral register and who should be included uh, in it and thus formally uh, um, seen as Sami and possibly um, uh, as a subject to indigenous rights. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this uh, discussion and debate has been going on since the 1990s. Uh, Veli Pekka has uh, written in Finnish much about it. And, uh, and so it has long roots, but in 2012, around that time, uh, the debate was uh, gaining sort of new uh, intensity, uh, in part or uh, quite largely as a result of uh, new academic texts, academic knowledge production that was supporting um, the kind of arguments that are central to this struggle, whereby people who previously have... Uh, <laughs> have been identified by others or by themselves as, as Finnish and uh, who, uh, whose ancestors, who maybe have some Sami ancestors but going very much back to the 18th, early 18th century and so forth and which the Sami do not recognize as Sami because uh, of, uh, of, of their own uh, local and cultural and historical knowledge and understanding of, uh, of the ethnic difference. So basically um, this struggle has very much related to people who uh, have been outside the Sami community wanting to be recognized as Sami in order to gain access to the electoral register for various, various of different reasons. And, uh, and so in 2012, uh, these uh, movements uh, became much stronger because this academic knowledge emerged, which was uh, kind of creating new arguments or new discourses in support of these um, identity projects that I would today conceptualize in terms of self-indigenization. This self-indigenization is a concept that is used widely uh, also, for example, in Canada, in North America, and increasingly also in Australia, uh, in each context of which you have similar identity struggles, which have emerged in response to, and to some extent, as backlash to the development of uh, indigenous rights. So basically, uh, there was this new academic knowledge production, and uh, this was making many Sami feel that they were increasingly unable to uh, defend their right to define the boundaries of Sami community and to be able to say who is Sami, because these new discourses were sort of flooding with, uh, with um, kind of um, theories and concepts uh, that were making any argument against these new identity claims appear as if you were um, exclusivist or uh, afraid of uh, difference and, and, and so forth. So there was this kind of a problem that it was very difficult to talk about these uh, struggles in ways that would be understood uh, by the dominant society. And... Uh, and uh, so there was almost no discussion because this was a very difficult issue until in spring 2013 in Facebook uh, there emerged a, a, a kind of a series of uh, online discussions initiated by uh, uh, Pekka Samalahti who is an uh, emeritus professor in uh, Sami language and culture. And uh, so on his Facebook pages he started to kind of initiate this debate and people really jumped into it and used it as a platform to discuss this issue in quite uh, elaborate ways. So these were actually very good discussions which had many different 
views uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, presented and arguments and different people arguing. And uh, Suopantero didn't participate in these discussions, which, by the way, received enormously attention. So they were followed in Sweden, in Norway, also in the States, uh, uh, where there's also Sami communities, etc. So they received a lot of audience. And uh, Suopantero didn't uh, participate in, but it started to uh, publish uh, posters that were direct commentaries on the discussions. And often these... Uh, these um, <clears throat> posters would emerge the same day. So if you were following these Facebook discussions, you would know that these posters actually came as instant replies to those discussions. And so one of the examples of these uh, posters that emerged, emerged that spring, it was like uh, maybe two or three months uh, total that these discussions were being very intensive almost every day. So this is uh, one poster that was published uh, in April 2013. And now this image, uh, you can definitely read it without any local knowledge, uh, except that you have to know that this uh, sleeve is actually uh, uh, a sleeve of a, of a Sami Gakti. So uh, if you know that, then you recognize that this is a Sami appropriation of uh, the Facebook picture. If you know a little bit more, you know that Lihkon means like in North Sami. Um, so, okay, so there's a Sami appropriation of the Facebook Lihkon thing. But what actually happens is that this uh, poster was uh, published in response to very uh, specific events. So basically, uh, these discussions in the Facebook that I described, uh, they were very intensive, but it was also uh, like most people who followed them would not dare maybe or want to put them in the, in the line. They wouldn't want to participate, but they would like. And so there became an economy of who likes which comments, whose comments, like whose side are you on. So liking became uh, an important aspect also of taking part in these discussions uh, and showing your solidarity to certain views, etc. Uh, um, but in addition to this, um, this Lihkon uh, poster had another uh, context-specific meaning because as these debates became so sort of central, uh, some uh, parents uh, complained uh, uh, to, that there had been school teachers in Inari uh, who had been uh, liking the kind of wrong comments. So there, has, there was like a complaint made uh, about two Sami teachers who had been liking uh, comments that were uh, supporting uh, or that were criticizing these new academic texts that were advancing these self-indigenization uh, <coughs> arguments and identities. And basically what happened is that the school actually took act uh, action, they uh, got a verbal warning and then after a few days uh, later the um, municipalities uh, uh, what is called educational division issued a letter that told that all its employees should try to refrain from taking sides in online uh, discussions. And of course, this was for everybody. But frankly, in Inari, there had been many Facebook uh, debates uh, on these issues and others before, but never with Sami voices really being uh, <laughs> voiced so clearly. So of course, this was not a... a uh, there was a moment at which this uh, letter was issued, and it was that moment at which Sami started participating in the debate. And so what I argue is that, the, that this Lihkon poster, it again operates on several levels, because those who were aware of all this, they see, they see this Lihkon poster in a very different light, and, and therefore uh, only those who can read this immediate context uh, they, they know that what it is about on this level. And I think there was a kind of a creation of togetherness between people who would share this knowing that the others also know what this is really about on this local level. So this is one way in which uh, Suha Pantero's posters are contributing or were contributing to the construction of political no community between those who like... Uh, <laughs> who like and share these images because they know what they actually refer to. Uh, second poster, and I have no idea how much I have time left, but the second, uh, how much do I have? Five minutes. G, oh, sorry, I didn't say anything. Okay, so second, uh, actually, I'll skip over this. We can discuss it later. Uh, third one um, 
is uh, uh, this um, posture, Moon Might, Natural Sap Mirations. And uh, this, every one of us will recognize where it comes from. It's from the Raisins uh, box. And again, you can interpret this as decolonizing in a nice way without knowing anything about the context. Um, if you know, again, a little bit more about the context, you, if you know North Sami, you know that Moon Might means me too. And actually, this was published in 2013, and uh, I don't think the Me Too, I think I, don't, I didn't realize that it referred to Me Too at that point, but maybe the people who did it uh, were aware because I just checked from Wikipedia today, and 2006 was the first year that the <laughs> Me Too uh, discussion started. So maybe they already knew about this, I don't know. But uh, basically, um, <clears throat> of course, even if without the Me Too campaign, you can see this picture. As, uh, as asserting that we also exist, we are still here also, we, we are also part of humanity or whatever. So you can read this kind of meanings to it if you know not Sami. However, again, this also had a, a context in these Facebook discussions because basically um, this image emerged um, <clears throat> uh, uh, online uh, on the same day or on the following day uh, when um, the discussions in Facebook turned uh, to issues about the uh, Sami dress and Sami Gakti because basically the self-indigenization movement in Finland, one of its aspects has been uh, not just appropriation of Sami dress, but creation sort of of own dress, claiming that this is our dress and this proves that we are Sami. And, and so there's been use of duoji and there's been use of Sami clothing and uh, also kind of fabricated Sami clothing uh, to prove that or to make these claims that we are Sami too. And, uh, and so this was uh, much of a, a discussion, topic of discussion around the time that this poster emerged and there were all kind of uh, consideration and discussion of where this model of Gakti that they were presenting as their own had come, whether it was actually from tourism, where, what was the origin. So there was quite knowledgeable discussion about this Gakti. Um, but when, again, when you know that this image um, uh, emerge in that context, you understand that Moon Might actually refers to these campaigns of saying that we too are Sami, and it's ironizing them. So, um, <clears throat> so, uh, so that's another example of, uh, of how the kind of shared knowledge of the immediate context is actually producing a uh, sense of togetherness and political community among those who share these images and who know from each other that those others have also been following these conversations and can interpret it the same way. The third picture that I will not go to uh, uh, here, uh, I will just want to say that there was there's also an element of slaughter, of laughing together, of jokes, and this image which without this knowledge would look like very uh, gloomy because it's actually this uh, instrument here is the kind of instrument that was used to measure skulls in the context of this racial uh, racialist um, uh, examinations. So basically this picture also had uh, a context of um, in those discussions and specifically in the uh, a context of uh, laughter uh, to a Finnish politician uh, who has been sort of trying to uh, hamper uh, efforts to ratify the ILO 169 uh, that would uh, consolidate indigenous land rights uh, and arguing that there's a need for further analysis, uh, which is Olosuhde Analysi, which is uh, referred to here. So basically, this is making jokes about this uh, Finnish politician. And of course, uh, Eana, Olosuhde analysis. This is difficult for those who don't understand Finnish, but basically Eana, which is part of this Finnish word, is also a word uh, for land in, uh, in Sami language. So there's all kinds of hidden messages that you don't get if you don't know the context. Uh, conclusions. So <clears throat> I've said all the conclusions already. All the images uh, can be read as aspects of global visual commentary. But, uh, but they also have very specific meanings. And, uh, and uh, the centrality of, uh, like, like what I would say is that Sohpantero um, <clears throat> has become very popular actually in Finland, but at the same time as it's become more known and uh, like, a, 
lifted up in the context of art exhibitions, etc. Uh, nevertheless, the politics, the political issues have not really received any more majority society sympathy. So, so there is the kind of a, uh, readiness to appreciate Sami arts, but do we actually uh, um, accept or appreciate the political messages that are there? And are we also able to read them? Um, so what I would say is that uh, I think it's, it's good, the work that the Sohpan Terra is doing, but how much of really the colonial effort it, effect it has uh, is a, a different topic. However, on the local level, I think it was very important because it provided by sharing, by liking, by kind of uh, somehow positioning yourself in relation to these images, uh, it kind of helped to generate and bring together a sensation of a political community around these issues at the time when expressing opinions uh, was very difficult because uh, uh, this topic really was so hot and because the Sami are in such a man minority that expressing these views, for example, in local newspapers, is very difficult. So I think this is a very important aspect of this indigenous culture jamming of uh, Suopan terror that should be appreciated perhaps more. And uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Laura. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions if... Uh there is any. <laughs> yes, CK? Um, I think uh, it's so interesting to see, as an art historian, uh, mm. how their ways of working uh, allude to former art activism, like uh, Guerrilla Girls, for instance, uh, the, the way they use humor and the way they work anonymously. But uh, how important is that kind of anonymity to Suom Pantera's uh, members? I, I mean, I, I know that you know some of them, and um, and uh, why? why? Why do they want to be anonymous all the time? I mean, there are always rumors. I've heard that mm. under Sundanas, yeah, who knows yeah. in Venice is part of this group. And yeah, okay. People yeah. seem to know a little bit, but not all. But so you mean like, why do you think anonymity is, is, is important? so important for them? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Well, I, now I'm also talking a little bit about personal <laughs> opinion, but uh, but yeah, it was very clearly stated by Suah Pantera in the beginning that uh, this uh, is an important uh, Aspect, uh, on the one hand, uh, when you are anonymous, anyone can be Suah Pantera. So it doesn't matter if you're one person, because you could be a thousand persons, you know. So there's this kind of mysticism, uh, which, uh, which is important. And I think there's a very close affinity with the Zapatista movement's example mm. of, of how you can use uh, the, the act of covering up as a, as a form of empowerment also, because mm. uh, then the opposite uh, or the, the enemy or whatever it doesn't really know who you are and you could be any, anywhere this is also guerrilla warfare right mm -hmm. anybody could be part of the moment uh, but it's also a precondition and I think I have to say that I think it's changed now but really the the environment the, the discursive environment and the public uh, sphere in early 2010 was much more uh, uh, narrow and it was much heavier in a way and I think that at that time, definitely, it was a precondition for actually discussing many of the matters. Because you have to remember the Sami are in a small minority, even in the Sami homeland region. And, uh, and that part of Sami who actually even wants to participate in any discussion is even smaller. So if you want to present views, you are going to put yourself in a direct opposition with people you meet daily in the shop. And it's actually not quite nice. Like, uh, there is a lot of tension. And so being able to discuss anonymously was important uh, for Suopan Terror. Personally, I think uh, it should have been kept totally anonymous <laughs> because I think it suffered a little bit when uh, it started to... Yeah. Uh, yes, we have another question. Of course, there are all kinds of vaguely similar activity on this in the Facebook corner of the internet. Mm. But what could imagine, for instance, as that this uh, project here uh, uh, might set a, a precedent for other 
uh, groups struggling with similar minority or colonial uh, problems like, okay, this is a good idea. Yeah. We do it, we do it too. Yeah, well, that's a good question. That would be actually a wonderful thing to study, to bring together these different indigenous uh, uh, culture jamming <laughs> examples. Surely there's a lot. Uh, I'm not the right person to say uh, much about it because I haven't really studied, but I do uh, at times come across with a kind of similarish um, uh, forms of uh, action and even actually because I am uh, I'm working quite closely with other scholars who work with this phenomenon of self indigenization that I referred uh, in 2010 when I was uh, uh, looking at this I didn't really know that this is a transnational phenomenon but now it's very much increasingly clear and it's a very interesting field of research to be honest um, so I have noticed that there has been this kind of activism also in those contexts even around the same topics so that's a uh, yeah so it would be wonderful to take time to look at it properly but i can't talk much about that but thank you for the question yes we have another one here um given that the aesthetics of the work is quite pleasing and also sort of common on the internet has this, and that there's a lot of subtlety in the uh, statement being made, the political statement being made, has this type of work then been reappropriated by white people and altered, given that it's disseminated through mm. the internet and Facebook, and I'm sure a lot of people share it, not really understanding necessarily the context yeah. behind it. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I exactly understood, but I think you could <laughs> you could ask, is it appropriation if we celebrate this in galleries but refuse to listen to the message or refuse... Like, I do find it in a little bit, you know, in some ways troubling that uh, that there's been so much... Uh, that his, his rock band that is so welcomed, but the political messages are not. So there is a certain contradiction. But, actually, I refer to this in the article... Uh, Suor Pantero's own position to this has been like, it doesn't matter, like we live contemporary times, uh, all publicity is good publicity. So, of course, it's also still a way for them to somehow uh, uh, be the active, not the, how do you say, reactive uh, uh, party in, 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 uh, in creating the image trees, etc. So, and, and, and creating discussion around this issue for around, around Suopantero's work instead of uh, reindeer herdings uh, uh, killing wolves without legal permission. You know, like it's a, like you can direct what are the issues that are, what are the parts of Saminess that are being discussed. When you have an exhibition opening, Suopantero will be discussed even if the political message doesn't go through. So, so uh, but you could say that it's a certain form of appropriation when Indigenous art is so elevated, but colonization and land grab and all this stuff happens still, yeah. Yes, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, then it's my, uh, it's a great pleasure again to welcome our next speaker, speaker. Uh, Mette Sandby, uh, my old friend and colleague, um, who is a professor at, uh, of photography studies, uh, studies at the Department of Art and Cultural Studies uh, at the University of Copenhagen. She has uh, published uh, numerous books and articles on contemporary art and photography, uh, well, you know, and photography as part of visual culture. And she was uh, also the first editor, um, also the editor of the first Danish history of photography, as well as of um, the book Digital Snaps uh, from 2014. So it, the floor is yours, Matte. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And as Laura said, I'm really happy and honored to be in this great book and actually I'm also really happy to be in Bergen uh, today although the I mean uh, well because the weather is so fantastic but also because I really like uh, Bergen as a city so so it's super nice to have the occasion post-corona to return to Bergen 
So my talk is, uh, is the same as the, <coughs> the same title as uh, my contribution to the book, Negotiating Postcolonial Identity, Photography as Archive, Participatory Aesthetics and Storytelling in Contemporary Greenland. I have small, four small parts. First, an introduction. Then I will talk about phot the photographic archive as an artistic uh, strategy, talking about the work of Pia Arke then about photography as uh, participatory aesthetics and storytelling, uh, about a project called Project Siunisak, and then I will wrap up a strategy of counter-memory uh, fi finally. But I thought I would have just a really short introduction to Greenland in a few numbers. Um, I mean, most of you know probably these uh, years, but it can be good to just be reminded about it that Kind of um, in 1721, uh, we had the expedition of the Danish-Norwegian uh, missionary Hans Eel, is, and that is seen as the first step towards Greenland officially becoming a Danish colony, which it became in 1814. And uh, then later it became a county. It had a new status as a county in uh, 1953 as a county of Denmark. Uh, so 30 years later, um, well, uh, almost 30 years later, uh, <coughs> the Danish parliament granted Greenland a home rule government. And then 30 years later, uh, in, uh, in uh, 2009, um, a new referendum strengthened the self-rule system, uh, although uh, Greenland today remains a part of the Kingdom of Denmark. So this more uh, recent augmentation of Greenland's autonomy and its partial separation from Denmark has also opened up new currents and discussions of what it means, what the col colonial relationship between Denmark and Norway is, uh, discussions of nationalism and uh, identity politics, etc. And right now the debate is stronger than ever, maybe um, related to the wish for uh, total independence from Denmark. But right now, one could say uh, Greenland is still a part of the, the uh, Danish realm and also is dependent on substantial economic support from Denmark. And then I just uh, put up the area because sometimes you forget that how huge Greenland is. So it is um, more than two uh, mil million uh, square kilometers and around uh, 56,000 uh, people live in uh, Greenland, uh, around 19,000 of them in the capital, Nuuk. And just, uh, I'm, a, I'm actually not, can you fly from Bergen to, uh, directly to uh, Greenland? It takes, there's a direct fl flight from Copenhagen and we, it takes five hours to, to fly there. Today, one can also speak of a current in contemporary visual arts in music, theatre, literature in Greenland, which actually started already in the 1990s, in which artists um, in many and varied forms maneuver between the local and the global that we've heard about uh, in uh, Laura's pa uh, paper as well, in some sort of a post-colonial framework. Actually, the political scientist Ulrich Pramgal has suggested the term post-postcolonialism as a way to challenge any essentialism as well as the constant referencing of Denmark as kind of the colonial other, the colonial master uh, in an identity policy occurring in Greenland today and around the years leading up to the 2009 referendum. Throughout uh, the 19th and most of the 20th century, photography was among the main tools for communicating knowledge about Greenland to the rest of the world, not least to the Danish public. But most photographs, like this one, uh, were taken by the Danes. <coughs> uh, you know, all know these kinds of... Uh, um, yeah, it, that's even not a Danish photographer. Uh, but it's definitely not a, Norwegian, uh, a Greenlandic photographer. So recently, however, new photo-based narratives and practices have begun, begun emerging in order to re-evaluate the colonial archive. So in, I think in that sense it relates a lot to what Willi uh, uh, Pekka talked about. Um, re-evaluating the colonial archive or to develop new participatory strategies for using the medium of photography to renegotiate post-post-colonial Greenland, to create alternative histories and to develop history and identity from below, one could say, from the private um, personal experiences, for instance. And photographs here are seen as some kind of performative, affective, place-making interlocutors between people, memory, lived experience, and 
historical knowledge. So here's an early example of this newer current. So this is my part two. The main subject of Pia Arke's art was the colonial relationship between Denmark and Greenland, unavoidably inter intermingled with her own private story. Her father was a Danish telegrapher uh, who came to Greenland and her mother was um, a native Inuit. She managed to shed important light on the pre uh, previously unarticulated displaced aspects of the colonial um, Past, and she did it by, among other strategies, making the forgotten archival photographs talk. In her work, especially the artist book Stories from Scorsby Sun, she appropriates already existing photographs and relates them to oral culture and to personal memory. So, close the town without a future. That was a headline of a feature article in the Greenlandic Danish newspaper, which Pia Arge, when she lived, she lived in Copenhagen because she studied at the Art Academy in Copenhagen. She read that headline in 1996. So the town in question was what was then uh, earlier all on called Skorsby uh, today called Itokortumit in Greenland, populated by around 600 people on the uh, east coast, the northern east coast. Few Danes, know, here you can see where it's uh, located. Few Danes know about this town, and it has hitherto played almost no role in the history of neither Denmark nor Greenland. It is, or it rather was, maybe a town with no collective memory, a town invisible to many. For instance, it's so remote, and the weather is uh, rather difficult and bad, so it's only twice a year that, uh, you know, stock and uh, uh, whatever food uh, can be. Uh, brought there with, by ship. Uh, <coughs> the author of the article was the Danish district doctor in charge of the area who describes Gorsby Sund as a town spoilt by violence and alcoholism, an image that is not unfamiliar to the Greenlandic nor the Danish reader. The article uh, became the starting point for an artistic project carried out, out by Pia Arge, which resulted in the book Gorsby Sund Historia that came out in a revised edition with English and Greenlandic text as well in 2010. Um, <clears throat> Through an elaborate use of found photographs as well as her own photographs and texts, the artist manages to reopen the city as well as its collective memory and to turn the town into a locus of active, recognized memory and emotions via the archival photographs. The town was artificially constructed in 1925 when 87 Inuit uh, from 10 different families in Angmaxalik, which is today Tasilak, 1,000 kilometers south of the place, uh, including Pia Arge's grandparents, were transported 1,000 kilom kilometers north to form a Danish post in northeastern Greenland before the Norwegians claimed the area. They didn't know where they were going and why. The official story is that the Danish government moved the people to prevent an overpopulation in Akmaxalik, where they came from. The truth is, in fact, that the settlement was planned due to a borderline fight between the Danish and the Norwegian government, both claiming territory in the unpopulated northeastern Greenland. Therefore, it was important for the Danish government to colonize and to claim Skorsby Sund. So on September 4, 1925, the ship with the settlers arrived. The borderline conflict about the right to the eastern coast ended in 1933 when the International Court of Justice in Haag in Holland settled the issue in favor of Denmark. Arke's mother was born and raised in the town and Arke herself was born and lived there until the age of three. She wanted to make the history of this town visible and recognized. She begins her book. Scorsby Sun is a collection of local stories woven by the threads of other stories, partly personal and family stories, partly the much broader colonial and global stories. The private, the aesthetic, and the geopolitical are to some extent intermingled here, somewhere in the middle of it all, in the middle of nowhere. And she continues to comment on the fact that photography has been a central medium in the process of colonization, recording and documenting how civilization has penetrated to the most remote parts of the world. The photograph depicts this irrevocable process, but it does more than that. It helps to conquer, to gain territory, to take possession of it. 
The book consists of photographs, most of them from the 1920s and 30s, but also more recent images, most of them taken by the Danish members of the Danish Colony Committee. In addition, the book includes her own photographs of people she met when traveling there, her text and a collection of the first maps of the place, as well as a text written by the Swedish author Stefan Jonsson. Her text includes archive material and interviews conducted with locals from Scoresby Zone and Danes who, oft, uh, who once visited the town, as well as descendants of the, first mem the members of the first committee. <coughs> She recounts personal narratives such as the story of her own half-brother, her mother's firstborn, who as a child in 1955 was killed and eaten by a dog team on the first day in spring when the light came back and she writes, the sky was completely orange, unquote. She has never seen a photograph of this brother before she finds one in a Danish private album that belongs to the widow of a former colony manager. So this is also very much about the rights to the archives and where are the archives. It's most often outside where people actually live. Elsewhere, she recounts how a man, O, the one you see on the left, in 1972 disappeared on his boat in the fog, leaving behind his wife and eight children. She recounts how the original 10 families were each given a house built from turf, measuring 12 square meters in floor space. Because Marx oxes were protected from uh, hunting by Danish law. The town was also suffering from famine only a few years after it had been found, founded. Until 1925, when the Danes came, the natives had never experienced such juridical restric restrictions. But since the area was claimed by the Kingdom of Denmark, they suddenly came under Danish law. And on the right, you see Magnus Anike, who came uh, in 1925 with his uh, wife, and uh, they shortly after they uh, they had they brought their children. They had five children, and ten days after they arrived, his fa his uh, wife died. So he had to wait nine years before a, a new wid a, a, a woman was widowed, so he could marry that uh, widow. <clears throat> piece by piece, she collects the story of this town without a history almost like putting together a gigantic puzzle. Arge's representational strategy is, one could say, to invent the, t the town as a concrete place with a concrete history. This is achieved by a process of making visible the faces, naming them and identifying the individual, individual stories of these old photographs, very much like we heard about the Sami photographs. Uh, <clears throat> so here is, for instance, a photograph with her great-grandmother, Just Justine. Um, and many of these old photographs were found in archives in Denmark and elsewhere, and saved from archival obliv oblivion. She constructs the place of Scorsbyson as an ongoing mental process, something thoroughly latent, relative, and constantly being performed with and among people. And in the book, she maps out an embodied and emotional geography of that place. <clears throat> this is from uh, kind of an exhibition showing her uh, sketches and her work on the book. <clears throat> um, so her answer to the newspaper headline, Close the Town Without a Future, was to give it a past. In an interview made in an early phase of the project in 1998, she describes the Scorsby Sund project this way. It is about the role of the individual subject in relation to the power structure you, you live in. I relate to that in a visual way with my history project from Scorsby Sund. I investigate how you can form your own identity from a knowledge of who you are, what you can claim, and what you can influence. These things lag behind many places in Greenland. So this striving for empowerment via photography and via the archival material leads me to my second example. Since 2015, Danish photographer Tina Enghoff and psychology professor and director of the Center for Research on Children, Youth and Family Research at Ilisi Matu Safik, Greenland's University in Nuuk, Peter Berliner, they have carried out a project called Project Siunisak, meaning the future, in several small towns in Greenland. But here I will mention Tasilak in East Greenland, Greenland until 1992 named Amaxalik, so that was the place where Pia Arke's ancestors came from and were deported to uh, Skorsbysund. <coughs> 
and then the Nauta League in South Greenland. The function of the project is to provide empowerment and capacity building for children and young people in Greenland, encouraging them to exercise their rights according to the UN Children's Convention. The goal is to involve children and young people in artistic activities with the help of participatory photography workshops and by focusing on important issues in their daily lives. The background of the project were the huge social problems that dominate many of the small towns of Greenland, resulting in a major neglect of children and too many cases of violence and sexual abuse. This is a fact that has kind of been also documented in Danish documentaries, and whereas it's this side, we see that very rarely. Between 2015 and 18, the project consisted of many smaller parts, all entitled something starting with our, our lives, our projects, our family, our stories. And here I will just briefly mention our lives and our food, which were both photography-based workshops culminating with a book production. This is from the book Our Lives, uh, Our Rights. Uh, <coughs> um, it was a book about the rights of children and young people and their views of what constitutes a good life, their vision of a good life. Apart from quotes from the UN Children's Convention, all pictures and texts in the book were created by the young people in the two towns during week-long workshops, all using professional uh, camera equipment. The book was household distributed in Nanota League and Tasilak in November 2015. And this is from the project Our Food, and here I quote from the website. A workshop-based course in which young people gather recipes from their grandparents. Stories about food traditions, recipes, and photographs are collected in a little cookbook, which is distributed in the towns. These recipes are prepared and sampled communally in co collaboration with schools and meeting places. This culminates in a food fest festival with street kitchens and is highlighted in the city space. So here you see the book. The, the exhibition, the, the cooking festival, and everything was arranged by the young people themselves. As with our lives, all photographs, text, exhibition material, and food production was made collectively by the children and young people. This is from uh, an, an exhibition related to the food festival in Nanotelik. <coughs> And this is just the most recent example of uh, that kind of collaboration between an artist and between uh, doing workshops with young people. This is a book called Displaced uh, and an exhibition that was um, made uh, two years ago in Nanota League and in Nuuk and is actually shown at the Ro Royal Library in uh, Copenhagen right now, made by Tina Inghoff as an exhibition and as a book. It tells the story of David Christoffersen, now uh, 75 years old, but who in the 1950s, as a small child, he was sent or displaced from his family in an hotel uh, to Denmark, which was not uncommon. The reason why that he was limping, and there was a local nurse who said, okay, he should go to a hospital in, uh, in Denmark, and then the family just agreed um, for that. And he stayed there for several years without really knowing why, and later in his life, when he came back, uh, a couple of years after, he couldn't remember his family, he couldn't remember his language or anything. Later in his uh, life, he had no contact with Denmark and very little memory of what happened when he was there. So Tina Inghoff has researched the archives in Denmark and in Nuuk, interviewed David, been in an hotelik, and all that has resulted in the book Displaced. On the left, you see some private photographs that she, she found in uh, in private family albums of uh, children, uh, uh, families to children who were at the same children's um, orphanage home that David uh, spent some years in, in the 50s. And she just kind of deliberately cut them out to kind of uh, conceptualize the idea of forgotten memory and forgotten, um, yeah, and who owns the archives, uh, one could say. So, but, uh, so it resulted in an exhibition with images and with two videos and the book. Uh, but when uh, she showed the exhibition in Nanota League, she made a, a <coughs> workshop with 12, 9 to 10th uh, grade elementary school children, where they produce so-called memory books in the same way as she has done uh, as she, with, with her book, uh, but also with the previous uh, workshops that I mentioned before. 
and inspired by her own work about David, whom they met during the workshop. Each student received a very beautiful cloth-bound empty book to fill with images and texts. Finally, exhibited at the exhibition opening of her uh, show displaced and an event where the whole uh, town was invited. So here you see some of the, the children's books and this is uh, actually David in the middle uh, of the photograph here. <clears throat> so the Siunisak projects are collaborative social projects but they're using methods from art and they are producing photo books. The two cases that I have so briefly presented here are both carried out in a cross field, one could say, between art, activism and social projects. <clears throat> Pia Arge, oh here see, you see the exhibition uh, in the local municipality um, house with all the books. I mean, these are really small uh, towns. Uh, there, I think, I don't remember, around 1,400 people or something live in uh, Nanotalik. So Pia Arge is making art, but she's inspired by the methods of anthropology. Pia, Tina Inghoff and Peter Berliner, they are making a collaborative social project using art um, as a method and creating research from the psychosocial workshops, as well as creating new archives in the form of the books. So both projects were project or uh, process oriented. At the same time, they were resulting in uh, photo-based books, including a multiplicity of voices. Both projects are about naming, about empowerment and identity, about history making and archival retrieval and re-evaluations. And both re represent counter narratives producing counter memory to use a uh, a term by uh, Veronica Tello. So how do we create counter archives, counter narratives, counter memories or new memories if the colonial narrative and the colonial archive is all we have, one might ask. I would suggest at least that the silence of the archive is no alter alternative. Pia Arke focuses on the private everyday experience of specific people with specific names within the colonial archive, thus bringing together the individual and the collective history. Enghoff and Berliner build a new local archive of photographs, narratives, recipes, and more, all produced by the young uh, local people to empower them to face their own future and to create the future. Both projects uh, draw attention to the importance of memories and personal experiences in collective social contexts. These projects were produced as synthesis of systematic research on a project, the colonial past, the children's right, uh, according to the UN uh, rules in contemporary Greenland, and as an aesthetic strategy to let small histories interfere with the larger geopolitical context. The projects maneuver at the intersection of aesthetics, politics, anthropology, history writing, which is the specificity, in fact, of photography, and they treat photography as active objects. Thirdly, one could say that these projects recruit and negotiate the past for the sake of the living, while at the same time criticizing and interrogating the production of knowledge of the past. Which is why I will end with a quote from Sadia Hartmann, a text called Venus in Two Acts. How can a narrative of defeat enable a place for the living or envision an alternative future? There are at least two ways the historical operation can make a place for the living. One is attending to and recruiting the past for the sake of the living, establishing who we are in relation to who we have been. And the second entails interrogating the production of knowledge of the past. I think these two cases or projects that I've mentioned do both. Thank you. Yeah, we also have time for some questions for, for Matta. If there are any <coughs> comments or questions. Yeah, hello Matta. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very really interesting to listen to your uh, discourse on uh, Pia Arke. I saw that exhibition in Louisiana myself, uh, which was displaying all these photographs uh, of her from Scorsby soon. So it's very interesting to hear your evaluation or analysis of it. 
Um, but you did not mention the, the uh, manifesto of P. Arke, the ethno-aesthetics. You speak about art and then you made anthropology in, in bracelets. So why did you uh, write anthropology and not ethnology, since uh, Pia Arke herself referred to it as ethno-aesthetics? Yeah. Uh, thinking yeah. About this, yeah. I could have used the word eth ethnography as well, and it, of course it's an important text, and it, I, I write about it in the text, in the book, in this the book, yeah. uh, ethno uh, aesthetics, be because that's really interesting uh, concept that she invented herself in a certain, in a sense, uh, which is about. I mean, she was when she started doing the book. There, what, when we heard about um, art from Greenland, it was very, you know, fur uh, handicraft. Um, uh, also, which is, of course, an important part of Greenlandic culture, but there was no conception of like an independent, uh, maybe global uh, kind of art. So she kind of used this ethno and turned it, you know, upside down in, in that concept of ethno aesthetics, which is super interesting. Yes, can I uh, just yeah. uh, make yeah. additional is ask then? Uh, do you think that there is any problems with this concept of ethno aesthetics today in the present situation in Greenland? when this post-colonial or post-post-colonial situation is getting more prevalent and there are some objections to being uh, subject to anthropology or, or ethnology, which is slowly growing from, the, from some people in Greenland opposing this concept of anthropology or being mm. uh, uh, view, viewed in an anthropological perspective. Uh, and this is a, a, a also a problem in, in, in theater historiography because uh, uh, theater anthropology is very important and, and it's very really easily to, to transfer that to the Tukak experience. And there is some kind of generation shift taking place. I don't know if you have any, any points of view on that. I, I think there is. And, and sadly enough, Pia Arge died in 2007 and uh, it would have been really interesting to think of what her take on th that would be because of course she was I mean she was born in the when was it in the is late 50s and uh, so uh, I mean there are many things to think of in your in your question one thing is when she made that book it wasn't really I mean people didn't pay much attention neither in Denmark nor in Greenland it was like a little bit too early to do that so uh, which is also why I in a sense asked really Pekka about how has things changed because this the, the interest in that subject and discourse has changed immensely the la since she did her book and today. But for her, she was kind of in a little bit, maybe not in the same way that Sua Pantera, but kind of playing with old discourses. And she liked to play with the idea of ethno. There's a lot of humor in a lot of her works. And uh, so in many senses, uh, I mean, a lot is possible these days, but there has been maybe uh, one could, some would say a re-traditionalization -tradi in uh, local, uh, you know, art circles, for instance, in Greenland that, uh, that um, would be more kind of critical maybe of, of her work because she lived in, in Denmark and the book was published in Danish, for instance, firstly, and then just after her death in Greenlandic. So it's a super complicated uh, dis discussion, but um, sometimes, uh, yeah, well, um, it could have been interesting to hear how her take uh, of the whole dis discussion right now because she was very, you know, kind of, she was brought up and studied at the Art Academy in the 90s where the whole postmodernism was invoked. So she's kind of playing with the old codes and maybe some of it, of that is a little bit more you know, dangerous to do today, I would say, or criticized. Yeah. Uh, but I have a just question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I mean, uh, Tina Inghoff is now showing at the Black Diamond in Copenhagen, and and then uh, uh, Pia Orke was at Louisiana, and then the Danish produced uh, the new season of the Borgen, yeah. Borgen with yeah. centered on Greenland, and there are a lot of movies and 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 good literature and I mean has this uh, does this art production has that has it done anything to bring about more um awareness of uh, the, uh, the the Danish the colonial past in Denmark 
definitely it mm. has. So that's that's a very good thing, and it's which is also why I ask you, really Pekka, about this kind of renewed interest. It, it is. Uh, maybe one could say 80% positive, but there are some critical voices also that in a little bit, oh, now we must, like, there's this sense that, you know, every Danish museum must have in their strategy, we need something from Green Greenland, check. And whereas <laughs> 10 years ago, they didn't care at all. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it's positive that they actually do it. One yes. shouldn't criticize that. But there is a certain, you know, people who have been dealing with these issues for decades, they mm -hmm. kind of said a little bit, okay, why now? But... Uh, I would say that, for instance, also that Borgen is about Greenland. There are local critical voices against that as well, but but uh, it has uh, really meant something. And mm. I, for instance, ten years ago, we had a course in my department of cultural studies at the university where we w wanted to talk about art from the uh, from Faroe Islands and from Greenland, and we had to cancel the ca course because no students had an interest in it which was, I mean, think about it 10 mm. years ago, and now there's mm. a huge, we have research projects, we have exhibitions at Louisiana, and I mean, also, like, in her own time, Louisiana would never have touched her work because it was too complicated, it was kind of sketchy, photography, mm. installation, they couldn't understand it at all, so, mm. uh, but nev better late than never, <laughs> one could say. Yeah. And now they have bought some of her... Yeah, essays. it seems to me like it's... Uh, uh, Laura is, uh, is doing research on the Sami Renaissance perhaps in, in the Nordic countries. Perhaps there is this kind of indigenous Greenlandish Renaissance as well. Yes, going both on. in Greenland and in, and in Denmark yeah. or elsewhere, yeah. one could say. Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm. Which is positive. Yeah. But thank you again, Matta. Thank you. And now, <laughs> in this warm summer evening, we have reached the uh, final. Uh, Last and final presentation, which will be by Hilde and myself. So. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Much of the photographic legacy uh, connected to the Sami areas is dominated by images uh, produced by outsiders, such as scholars, missionaries, tourists, and government officials. Uh, so in this paper, we will um, discuss two collections of images produced by Norwegian bourgeois women, um, Elise Vessel and Margrethe Wieck, who respectively settled in Finnmark County in the 1880s and the 1920s. They both came as wife of government officials, Wessels, Wessel as a doctor's wife, and Vig as the wife of a minister of a Norwegian state church. Yet, um, Wessel and Wieck were both strong personalities who became more famous than their husbands. Like many other settlers and travelers, um, they, they photographically staged their own presses in the north, something which included taking photographs, notably also of Sami people. Elisa Vessel arrived Kirkenes, a tiny coastal village near the Finnish and Russian border, in 1886 as the young bride of Dr. Andreas Vessel. The village, with its 36 inhabitants, served as a mun municipality centre, thus manifesting the Norwegian presence along this very important strategic border um, towards the east. The place underwent uh, major transformations due the cop during the couple's lifetime. A growing mining industry with a subsequent m multiplied population in induced social changes and in increased political uh, polarization. The Russian Revolution also had a strong impact on the small community as waves of political refugees and activists entered the scene. In this context, Elisa Vessel entered a process of radicalization. Today, she is first and foremost celebrated as a union organizer, a socialist who formed close ties, political 
political ties to uh, the revolutionary East. She corresponded, among others, with Lenin and Trotsky, and received several prominent uh, communists on their way to Russia, among them the legendary feminist and, uh, and leader of the British Communist Party, Sylvia Pankhurst. Russell is also known for transgressing the gender limitations of her time. In 1923, 37 years later than Russell, Margrethe Wieck also arrived in Finnmark uh, as a young bride when her husband, Alf Wieck, was assigned to the parish of Karajok. They actually came from Bergen. However, while the vessels had settled in a multicultural and inland community of Norwegians, Samis, <laughs> Finnish immigrants, and Russians, uh, the weak couple um, uh, came to a Sami-dominated community where they stayed for 11 years before they were transferred to the coast. Like Russell, Margrethe Wieck became known for her social engagements. Among her achievements was uh, the production of the first Sami ABC in Norway. <coughs> um, and later, also the establishment of a nursing home for the mentally disabled. It, was, it is, however, in particular her engagement for the Sami language and the Sami course in a more general sense that makes her remembered even today. Because the two women held different ideological positions, one socialist and the other driven by the spirit of Christian mission, it's assumed that they had little in common. However, we question this assumption and uh, as we discuss the photographic heritage they left behind. We suggest that their grounding in bourgeois culture and their role as agents of modernity and civilization <coughs> of states and nation building caused them to transcend their differences. We also argue that their situatedness in, on the northern frontier opened up new possibilities to expand and transgress uh, the social, cultural and physical borders and limitation that was imposed on uh, bourgeois women at the time. Let's start by taking a closer look at Elise Vessel's uh, photographic practice. The first known photographs taken by Vessel is dated uh, 1895, the year she brought, bought her, brought her own uh, uh, camera equipment. It presents what must have been a typical scene in her daily life, her doctor husband returning from his home visits, pulled by a reindeer and accompanied by his vapus the local Sami sledge driver, Jon Andersen Must. It's difficult, however, to describe her development as a photographer without taking her personal development into consideration. We know that she remained childless after several miscarriages and the loss of a child. We also know that her marriage suffered when the couple was uh, separated for a period around 1900, she moved to Christiania, Christiania, no Oslo, where she attempted to establish herself as a professional photographer. But she returned to her husband the year after and resumed photographing in the north. Furthermore, it is known that she ceased producing new photographic material after becoming politically active from 1906 <laughs> onwards, following from the industrialization of the area. Most of the photographs she left behind, a collection of about six, 700 uh, images is kept in, local, in the local museum in Kirkenes. The majority of images are positives mounted in private albums, the photo photographer's own albums, as well as albums that she made for relatives and friends. But as Elise Vessel images were widely distributed, they are also found uh, to be found in several museums and archives in southern Norway, and we have even found them in photography archives abroad. What then does she photograph? The young doctor's wife photographs her surroundings, her dog, her husband, or her house and garden, or 
landmarks such as the local church, a Russian Orthodox chapel, waterfalls, open mountain landscapes, the post being carried on shore from the boat on the edge of a frozen fjord, or visiting guests, and not least, the Sami population inhabiting the landscape. In our context, it's interesting to note the strong Sami presence in her production. This observation also brings forth the question of why Elise Vessel started documenting her world through the camera. Her biographer, Steina Wikan, sees her photographic endeavors as primarily, uh, a primarily therapeutic, uh, therapeutic activity in response to a mental crisis, but he also labors it as an appropriate uh, bourgeois female activity in line with other artistic leisure, leisures, such as music, poetry, and painting. Some draw this, li this line even further, as such as Marte Fjellesta, who argues in favor of looking at Vessel's photographs as personal artistic expressions and explorations with close ties to the artistic styles to her time, the pictorialist movements and evocative landscape painting. Others interpret the Sami presence in her images as an indication of what they see as an ethnographic motivated project. Others, again, read a socialist engagement with the unfortunate and deprived in her images. Importantly so, to some point, Vessel's photographic work, uh, some point to, to Vessel's photographic work as a, typi as a typical of, time, of the time possibility for bourgeois women to obtain economic and social independence. However, however, in their eagerness to ascribe more or less idealistic purposes of, or liberating potential to Vessel's practice, these writers and scholars appear to have overlooked the primary, primary use uh, context for her images, notably the album. Mounted on the album pages, the images formed part of a story told for and by a limited social circle of Norwegian middle-class locals. In this way, the families of merchants, doctors, clergy, or the local law enforcement officials, as well as other civil servants, could see the images to form their own accounts and memories about their surroundings and about their exotic frontier life up north. The album display of frontier life furthermore included the almost ritual bourgeois excursions into the northern sublime landscapes with its with its exotic inhabitants. Thus, these albums also <coughs> mirror a particular worldview. Even so, as uh, conceptualized by Elizabeth Edwards, photographs are objects with their social biography. The vessel images eventually traveled out of the original album context and were circulated in a number of other settings up to our time. They have, in other words, been projected into different spaces to do different things. Vessel herself sold them to be users, used, for instance, as postcard or uh, for museum and research collections. Her photographs also featured that as illustrations in her husband's popular science publications and as lantern slide series um, titled In the Land of the Laps, in addition to being transformed into drawings into her later socialist propaganda material, as in her children's book, The Little Socialist, published in 1914. The culture of exploration and bourgeois excursion into the wilderness that featured in the albums is moreover also linked to the ongoing process of Norwegian nation building. A speaking example of this is the way Elise Vessel's photographs appeared in a grandiose, richly illustrated volume titled Norway in the 19th Century, published in 1902. Here they ac accompany several chapters about the northern regions, its history, biology, geography and culture. One of them is a chapter about the Sami, or as called her here, the Laps, by the Norwegian historian and geographer Ingvar Nilsen. He writes 
in line with the nation-building ideology of its time, with its inherent notions of civilization and racial hierarchy. Thus, Vessel's images of her Sami neighbors in this setting are anchored to a text that characterizes the Sami people as an inferior race. The Samis are, among other things, described as childish, sour-eyed, prone to alcohol, superstitions, and primitive forms of religious expression. As far as we know, Vessel never objectified to this contextual framing of her images, which, after all, represented the general view of the Sami at the time. However, the subject of race even was a topic of discussion in her home, as her doctor husband developed an interest in physical anthropology. In 1912, the couple traveled to Paris, where Andreas Wessel followed lectures in the subject at the university. Along the way, they also managed to find time to visit Hagenbeck's Human Zoo in Hamburg, where perhaps also Sami people were exhibited as species. Back home, he carried out anthropological research and Elisiv assisted as a photographer. They even tried their hand at ethnometric photography in their Sami neighborhood, but neither the images nor his research were ever published. We also know that they opened their doors to Norwegian physical anthropologist Johan Brun, who infamously excavated the Sami churchyard in the close by Naden. Today, these excavations have become a, the very image of the uh, Norwegian abuse of the Sami population. Let us continue by a closer look at our contrasting case, uh, the photographic uh, practice of Margrethe Wik. She arrived in Finnmark as a young um, woman in 1923 at a time when uh, Elizabeth Wessel, Elisa Wessel seemingly had ceased producing photographs. She came from Bergen, the hometown of the first Norwegian photographer to portray Sami individuals, Marcus Alma, um, and um, uh, in her luggage, she brought uh, several of his court of visit portraits given to her by Salma's daughter. But eventually, uh, Margrethe Wieck also started taking her own images of the Sami people she encountered. As with Wessel, it is pertinent to approach uh, Wieck's images in relation to her own life and to the private album for which they were produced. <coughs> well, Wessel's images often are carefully composed. Wieg is more typical of her time, snap a snapshot photographer in style. She also photographed her home and uh, in its surroundings and children playing in the snow and the forces of nature, such as, for example, a flooding, church activities, uh, including her husband work husband's work-related travels, um, and also friends in the, in the local community. Um, similar to Wessel, uh, many of her images um, dwells on uh, with, with a with limited social circle uh, of um, uh, Norwegian mid middle class uh, people in the area, and particularly their, their seemingly favorite pa pastime, excursions into the natural, natural scenery. Leaving through her albums, um, one event is particularly emphasized. She was obviously very much fascinated by uh, the shooting of um, the, the, at the time, internationally famous silent movie, Lila. The protagonist in this film is a Norwegian girl who, um, after having been rescued by, from a pack of wolves in the mountain as a baby, grows up among the Samis. As a young woman, she has to choose between marrying a Norwegian and a Sami man. The massive audience response to this film evolved as a veritable Lila cult and particularly among Norwegian middle-class women. For this gendered audience, uh, the romanticized 
photographic visualizations of Sarminas worked as nothing less than a trope of freedom. Perhaps the lively and sportly Margaret de Vick envisioned herself in this character. Uh, her album seemed to indicate that it was so. The romantic gaze is certainly present in Vick's photographs from the Sarmi areas. Nevertheless, and in spite of the tendency of segregation between the Nuesami and Norwegians in a local community, it seems obvious that Margrethe Wieck engaged more closely with her Sami neighbors than Basel. Uh, Karl Schokwo, the, the village that she lived, was uh, also a Sami dominated community. In cost, contrast to the Vessels, the Wieck family all learned uh, the Sami language and apparently socialized extensively, uh, also with members of the Sami population. Margrethe de Wieck ran, as, uh, ran an open home and her children had Sami friends. And each spring, as required by the church authorities, the whole family moved along with reindeer herding Sami families to the coast. This life obviously stimulated a curiosity in Vig of Sami culture and importantly also a concern about the challenges Sami children faced at school as a result of the Norwegian assimilation policy. She fervently addressed the issue of racism in, in the social democratic Norway. This is, for example, apparent in a letter we found in the archive addressed to the editor of two ch uh, Christian children's magazines. Here she argued against the racially biased uh, representations of non-Western cultures, including the Sami. All this can be seen as a background for her creation of the first uh, ABC for Sami children, which was done in collaboration with Sami children and the Sami artist Jon Savio, among others. Margrethe Wieck's interest in photography and Sami culture also led her to, she started naming project already, very early, uh, Veli Pekka. And she, uh, she also tried to identify the, the Sami subjects in the mid-19th century photographs by Selma. This is not an early example of, uh, this is not only an early example of, of the uh, of, of the no so important process of naming the nameless in typological portraits, it also bear witness to uh, to her efforts to bring a, bring forth important characters in Sami history. In this case, the first formally trained Sami midwives. While well, much has been written about uh, Vessel, little, little has been uh, written about Margaret de Wieck. Uh, and nothing about her photographic production. However, the few existing texts describe her in uh, almost hagiographic terms. According to Norwegian bishop Eivind Berghav, she discovered the soul of Sami children. After her death in 2002, she was characterized as one of the greatest and most powerful women in the north of Norway, the mother of many, not least for Sami children. Such statements are, however, situated in a particular culture. They reflect the worldview of the Christian missionary movement and its overall purpose of bringing light into the darkness. Although Vig had a great respect for the local Lestadian church, uh, Christian lay movement that held a strong position in the Sami communities, she contrasted it to the love and the light that she associated with her own Christianity. Um, thus, she was closely associated with the organized uh, Norwegian Sami mission and contributed uh, actively to their publication, so, such as the uh, such as Sami Nesvan, the friend of Sami, and her famous uh, Sami ABC has perhaps also a missionary dimension, recalling the immense significant uh, Lutheran uh, Christianity ascribed uh, the abil ability to read the Bible and pra practice Christianity, uh, um, Christian devotion in one's mother's tongue. As we see it, 
This uh, missionizing spirit fueled by ideas of social reform is a striking point of connection between our two frontier women photographers. This link becomes particularly apparent when we look at the both women's children's publications, where each of them made use of their photograph photographic images of the Sami as a basis for the non-photographic illustration. Uh, while Margrethe Wieck embraces the Sami children in the spirit of the universal humanism of uh, the mission culture, Elise Vessel, in a true socialist spirit, incorporates the Sami into the larger community of the international proletariat. Another notable and final parallel is their Norwegian middle class background. As members of the Norwegian community living in the outskirts of what they saw as civilization, they also established borders between themselves and the others. Both maintained their bourgeois identity and lifestyle, particularly expressed in images of their household interiors, picnics and Sunday excursions. Vessel's engagement with the working class and Wieck's efforts to support the Sami cause and language gave them something in return. Situated on the northern frontier, they conceived their life projects with photography as an integral part. They gained broader space for action, greater autonomy and more status than would have been possible in urban centers because of restrictions connected to their gender and social standing at the time. Appropriating Saminess, even, in, even if in different ways, was intrinsic to this process. Yes, thank you. So this is the last presentation today, uh, and uh, so we will we can receive some questions for you or comments if you have some, or otherwise we could also say thanks to all of you for attending, and it has been a really yeah thank you, and uh, there is also books to buy for those of you who are interested um, here from the bookstore at Literaturhuset, and, and the book is also uh, easily available online. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, but maybe yeah. I need a microphone. Yeah. Do you have your microphone on? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I need to get them. Okay. So, does it work? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I wanted, first of all, I was wondering, could you put back the image with the two covers? Uh, yeah, this one. So I wanted to ask, so who made these images? Uh, I mean, who made these painters? Or do you know? But, no. Margrethe Wieck was illustrated by Sami Children and uh, Jun Savio. No, but she also... Yeah. She also uh, and also made her own illustrations, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So this is made by us. Yes. yes. Okay, because... Uh, and uh, the other thing I wanted to ask is that... Well, I'll, I'll do my first comment because, well, these are fascinating images. I mean, uh, from the contemporary perspective, the ridiculousity of the uh, smoking pipes <laughs> at the, uh, behind... Um, uh, contrasted with the... Uh, with the, the context, but uh, on the other hand, this the one in Week's book, uh, I think it's interesting that you have the houses on the left and uh, <laughs> the, the Sami sort of traditional dwellings on the right. So I'm sure you have you know, also thought about this if we think in terms of linear representation, it doesn't give us the history as progressing from the from the hut to the house, but the other way, right? So I thought this is really interesting, and uh, I wanted to ask because they have such a different take on uh, the Sami future and futurity and what it would be like. But they're also separated by a couple of decades. So I wanted to ask you how much do you read this difference in their attitude to their uh, ideological leanings or personal qualities or time? Like how much did the general understanding 
of the problematic change in those decades. So, so how do you compare these different attitudes, given that they are separated by some crucial decades? What do you think about that? Yeah. It's a, it's a complicated question, and a, which requires a complicated answer, I think. I think it's, it's, it's not um, sufficient to, 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 to look at the time difference here, because uh, even at the time uh, of, of uh, the V couple in Karashok, I think that uh, they're, they're, uh, this, this couple had an extraordinary <laughs> attitude toward the Sami that was special even in their time, mm. uh, which was, uh, for instance, reflected in the fact that the book that uh, 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 Margette Wieck's husband wrote uh, was never published, mm. while uh, um, uh, because, uh, I would guess, because of its radical uh, perspectives uh, on the Sami, while the 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 the, the pastor in the neighboring Kautokeino uh, uh, published at the same time in the 1930s a uh, 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 work in racial biology based on studies on the Samis in the Kautokeino area. So that was the general uh, uh, atmosphere of the time. So this positive or uh, um, perspectives of the, of the week. Was, yeah. was a, they were ahead of their time. Absolutely, and yeah. I also think it had to do with their way of living, because as as we is mentioned here in the in the presentation, that they um, they had to follow the reindeer herders uh, to to the coast. That was part of their job to, to follow the people they work with. So they 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 travelled with them, uh, and they slept in their tents, and they were along the among them or much much closer than 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 uh, the 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 vessel couple who conducted racial research and so on. that was uh, who went around uh, to look for he writes uh, new possibilities for Norwegian colonization uh, that is how he states it quite directly so uh, and i think that uh, there is a, some there's an anti-colonial attitude in 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 the, the writing of uh, uh, Andreas, uh, oh, no, not Andreas, was of the we, week, because of week, because uh, 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 if before, but even though he is a priest in a, in a Norwegian state church and is there, you know, as a representative for for for, for the majority society, so but uh, we have written more about that than in the chapter. So yeah, he would, he would write things like uh, he 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 distanced himself uh, from from the views of the Sami as intellectual inferior and so on and so on. So he he takes a very explicit stance against the dominant uh, perspectives of his time. Yeah. Yes, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to ask you uh, whether the change of border in 1917 uh, close to Shirkanas had any effect on, on the way uh, the Vig couple um, uh, saw their border neighbors, because uh, obviously um, the border between between uh, Finland and, and uh, Norway is was a different and is a different uh, case than the border between the Soviet Union or Tsarist Russia, Russia and, and Norway. It, it's difficult to know because she 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 changed. I mean, um, the uh, the couple played very close uh, friendship relationship with Russians on the other side of the border, and particularly the Orthodox. Um, uh, priest uh, and his family, uh, but uh, and then and then the Russian Revolution came and the and the border closed and so on and and then uh, and then uh, came the 1930s and and I think that she became more and more uh, this 
desolutionized yeah. and 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 uh, less and less uh, uh, a socialist. She even um, we are told welcomed the Germans, the German occupation. Uh, in the beginning of the World War II, and well, then she died, of course, so we don't know how, how it would have proceeded, but yeah. But, but I, I'm but not with, sure. With, with the, whether that was connected to, it's difficult to know. Yeah. yeah. But they, for, for them, I mean, going back and forth across the border was a natural thing. They had done that because they, would, they were friends with the, with, the, with the priest and his family and the Orthodox Church at Naiden and so on. So, so I don't know if that changed that much for, for them. Well, uh, but, yeah. but they had to stop that. The, yeah, the connection perhaps. stopped. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that is the only thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, the chapel. Yes. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's the, it's the. I don't remember the name of the of the chapel uh, right on the other side of the border, but it's very very close to Shetkines. Yeah, Boskleb. That's mm. right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and. Any other question then? And we will say, say thank you again. <laughs> and please, <laughs> and, uh, you're very welcome to buy the book. Thank you. <laughs>